Hey, y'all. In the early 1980s, a couple in Chicago decided to move to the countryside of North Georgia in search of a quieter, simpler life. But the couple had secrets that led to their downfall, and some say the secrets linger on the grounds. Listeners note, this episode has some discussion of sexual activity that may not be appropriate for younger ears. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. In the 1970s, pharmacology professor Dr. Charles Scudder had grown disenchanted with his city life in Chicago. Despite his esteemed career and research in his field, the stress of teaching combined with university politics led him to burnout. Add in the chaos of living in the city, as well as his recent divorce from his second wife. Charles had always been considered eccentric by colleagues having owned a pet monkey in the past and dyeing his hair purple despite his teaching profession. He wanted to shake the shackles of academia and live life on his own terms. By this point, his three children were grown and out of the house, so it was just him and Joseph Odom. Joseph had been a housekeeper for the family, and his relationship with Charles had become a romantic one during that time. The pair were opposites in some ways. While Charles had a successful career in academia with a background in linguistics and zoology, Joseph had a fifth grade education and a more relaxed approach to life. However, despite their differences, the two loved each other immensely. In an article Charles once wrote in Mother Earth News, he's quoted as saying, He had learned far more about the world than I had with all my degrees. And somewhere along the line, he developed a talent for whipping up meals fit for a king, end quote. They both longed to start a new life together, somewhere quiet with more privacy than the city, where they could experience all four seasons without such brutal winters as they had in Chicago. They also were longing for picturesque, hilly countryside with an abundance of fresh water and wood for heating, a much simpler life, you could say. When Charles received a modest inheritance from his mother's passing in 1976, they believed they'd found their ticket to the lifestyle they were craving. Charles discovered a listing for 40 acres of woodland in Chattooga County in northwest Georgia. He made the 10-hour drive down to scout out the property and quickly fell in love. He wrote fondly of his first visit to the property. Quote, there I found hummingbirds, whippoorwills, butterflies, bobcats, great oaks, fungi, and rolling mountain woodland. End quote. That October, Charles submitted his resignation to Loyola University, where he'd been teaching for many years, and the couple began to minimize. They auctioned off their antique furniture and gave away everything electronic, since there was no electricity to the land that they'd purchased in Georgia. Finally, their Chicago mansion sold, and they were ready to set off on their new life adventure. In January, they headed to Georgia with very few belongings and one of Charles' most prized possessions, his gold-encrusted harp. You see, aside from his academic success, he was also an accomplished harp player who had once been invited to play with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Seeing as it was January, it was a harrowing trip for Charles, Joseph, and their two English Mastiffs. They'd been caught in a blizzard during the long drive, and seeing how they hadn't yet begun construction on the land, they had to sleep in their car and then a tent prior to getting their camper. As the weather began to warm, they got started, with only a concrete mixer, a garden tiller, and a chainsaw. Together, they cleared a section of the woodland, dug a well, and began constructing their dream home. By that following summer, they had the first story of their castle-like mansion complete, so they could live inside while construction was ongoing. The castle utilized medieval building techniques with rounded and angled walls, and it is said that there wasn't a single square corner to be found in the home. They also established a small vineyard to make their own wine and a vegetable garden in an attempt to be as self-sustaining as possible. But aside from the picturesque and definitely unique for the area architecture, 
the couple did have eccentric taste, and for many, that bordered on the creepy. Over the front door of their medieval-inspired mansion sits a pink concrete gargoyle. The pair also installed ornate stained glass windows like one might find in a cathedral, one of which featured a skull, and another of which was adorned with an image of Baphomet. Baphomet is a demonic deity, a humanoid figure with a goat's head. But more importantly, Baphomet is the figurehead and official symbol of the Church of Satan. Founded in the 70s by Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan doesn't actually worship him, but instead the founding principles are based around hedonism, a rejection of herd conformity, and a high priority on self-importance. And while it could be assumed that the couple just had a penchant for macabre aesthetics, it is confirmed that Charles Scudder was a registered member of the Church of Satan. And while this isn't something he openly discussed in his writings or publicly in any way, symbolism of it was riddled throughout Corpsewood Manor. One of their dogs was named Beelzebub, and the other Arsenath which is said to stem from Asenath, a character from an H.P. Lovecraft story, who is said to be able to inhabit others' bodies. The pair also named their homestead themselves, choosing the name Corpsewood Manor after being inspired by the barren autumn trees they loved. Life in North Georgia was a little trying for Charles and Joseph, with the town whispering about the two gay guys dressed like hippies who owned a creepy castle in the woods. Of course, it didn't help in their case that they rode around in a black jeep with a pentagram painted on the side. Curious townsfolk would creep up the long driveway to the home to be welcomed by a sign reading, Beware of the Thing. While most likely this was a reference to the disembodied hand from the Adams family, rumors started that the pair had summoned a demon from the depths of hell to protect their property. Others were whispering that they spotted robed figures in the woods performing satanic rituals. Now, remember, this is the early 1980s at this point, when satanic panic was at an all-time high in the United States. Media was riddled with the devil and occult storylines. Parents were trying to keep their children from playing Dungeons and Dragons because it had fantasy creatures and spellcasting that pastors claimed could be used to summon the devil a controversial memory recovery program was initiated, utilizing hack psychology to encourage people to recover repressed memories of ritualistic abuse. Large corporations were accused of being Satanists. I mean, the list goes on and on. It also doesn't help that this is the same time of the Atlanta child murders, where young black boys and men were disappearing in Atlanta to later turn up dead. One of the prevalent theories at that time was that a homosexual pedophile ring was responsible for the killings. This is also the time of the beginning of the AIDS crisis, where little was known about the disease except that it was a mysterious illness affecting primarily gay men. It's safe to say that Charles and his husband Joseph had an even more difficult time fitting in and thriving in small-town Georgia than your average gay couple in the early 80s. However, those brave enough to venture to the estate only had glowing reports of the couple and their hospitality. Just as Charles had described in the article, Joseph was an incredible cook and sometimes served elaborate multi-course meals complete with the couple's homemade wine. Charles would entertain guests by playing his beloved golden harp beautifully. The pair were social butterflies and loved the company and were really quite charming despite their dark aesthetic. So charming that despite their reputation in the town, they acquired a group of friends in the area and routinely socialized. In addition to their majestic estate, they constructed a more modern, separate building off to the side. This three-story square building they deemed the Chicken House as the lower story was exactly that, housing for the chickens they acquired. Going up the ladder inside to the second floor, however, this story housed the couple's significant pornography collection alongside their canned goods storage. 
proceeding further to the third story of the chicken house. This room was painted all pink and dubbed the pink room. The pink room held a lantern, a kerosene heater, and a couple of mattresses, and was a place for Charles and Joseph to gather with their male friends and visitors for consensual, casual sex. It is said that many dinners and events at Corpsewood Manor ended in that room, free of judgment and any societal expectations. There was even a guest book that stayed in the pink room, where visitors could log the events, write notes, and detail any specific sexual preferences they had. Unsurprisingly, rumors of the pink room did little to bolster the couple's reputation in small-town Georgia. To the locals, the gay Satanists are now hosting orgies, and with the gossip spreading about the couple's proclivities, more unsavory characters began visiting Corpsewood Manor. In 1982, 17-year-old Avery Brock wandered onto the property, seeking out a good place for deer hunting. Charles happily gave Brock permission to hunt on their land, and over time, he became friends with the couple. Brock had had a difficult life with his father throwing him out at a young age, and he'd been struggling on his own. The three became close enough that later that year, they invited Brock to the pink room. After several visits over to Corpsewood, Brock told his roommate, Tony West, about the couple. Tony was much older than Brock, at 30 years old, and he had a history. Throughout his youth, he'd been bounced around through various jails and mental hospitals. Influencing the younger Avery Brock, Tony insisted that a couple who had such a majestic home must have riches stashed away inside of it. And together, tucked away in their rented mobile home, the two men created a plan to rob Charles and Joseph of this presumed wealth. On the evening of December 12th, 1982, Tony and Brock brought along two of Brock's unsuspecting teenage friends and began their journey up the long road to Corpsewood Manor. They brought along with them a concoction called Toodaloo, a mixture of alcohol, paint thinner, and glue. It was a cheap, quick way to get high from huffing the fumes. Dr. Scudder reportedly didn't have any interest in the Toodaloo, however, and had some of his homemade wine instead. After the typical delicious meal, Joseph stayed behind in the kitchen to clean up, while Charles went with Brock, Tony, and the two teenage friends up to the pink room. After chatting for a while, Tony stated he was going to the car to get more Toodaloo, but he returned with a rifle instead. Charles was reportedly unfazed, even cracking jokes about the presence of the gun, stating, bang, bang. But Brock and Tony were serious about their plan, and Brock grabbed Charles by the hair, put a knife to his neck, and interrogated him about where the couple had their hidden fortune stashed away. Charles remained calm and explained that they didn't have some secret stash of money in the house, and while they weren't wealthy as the criminals had hoped, what little money they did have was stored in the town bank. They had spent almost their entire life savings building the home that they loved. But Tony surprised everyone when he changed course and stormed down the ladder from the pink room, charging toward the manor house. Moments later, the sound of gunshots rang out. Tony then forced Charles and the two unwitting friends down the ladder from the pink room to see what the commotion was. There, they find that Brock had killed Joseph, as well as both dogs, shooting them at point-blank range. Charles, grief-stricken, ran over to his longtime love and became uncontrollable, despite Tony and Brock's insistence to point the way to the money that they still believed to be in the home. Charles collapsed to his knees next to his lover's body and stated, I asked for this. Exasperated, Tony shot Charles several times, who fell dead next to Joseph. Following the murders, Brock and Tony ransacked the house, still not accepting that there really wasn't a hidden hoard of wealth. After not finding anything, they grab whatever knickknacks they think could fetch a price and head toward the car. They did attempt to steal Charles' beloved golden harp, but 
Upon realizing they couldn't fit it into their car, that effort was abandoned. The two took their friends and went back home to their trailer, threatening them with death if they ever told anyone about the murders. Tony and Brock created a plan to run away to Mexico, so they returned to Corpsewood, stole Charles' famous black pentagram-adorned Jeep, and set out, heading west. By the time they got to Mississippi, they decided they needed a vehicle that garnered less attention. They stopped at a rest stop in Vicksburg when they noticed Kirby Phelps, a young Navy lieutenant who was taking a nap in the driver's seat of his Toyota. The pair forced Kirby from his car at gunpoint and walked him into some nearby woods. When he tried to run away from them, Tony shot and killed him. After killing Kirby Phelps, they resumed their drive west toward Mexico. Back at Corpsewood Manor, four days after the murders, a friend of Charles and Joseph stopped by to visit when they found the horrific scene. The local police called in the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to aid in the search for whoever had been responsible for the crime. Investigators discovered quite an unusual crime scene, as aside from the expected blood spatter and bullet casings, they also found satanic artifacts, whips, chains, a woman's wig, and the aforementioned extensive collection of pornography. There were also the interesting items Culler had acquired during his years in pharmacology research, like two human skulls and about 12,000 doses of LSD in vials. Most chillingly, during the search, they found a painting Charles had completed several months prior to the murder. The painting was a self-portrait of Scudder gagged and riddled with five bullet wounds dripping blood. Of course, the media reports really emphasized the scandal of the story, with headlines stating how two homosexual devil worshippers were murdered. They also stated that unusual sexual devices were found which I guess is the whips and chains that I mentioned. Some newspapers even published the crime scene photos. During the course of the investigation, Charles's Jeep was found and traced back to Corpsewood Manor, and police followed leads back to those two teenage friends who'd been present. One broke under questioning and told police what they had witnessed the night of the murders. This allowed local police and the GBI to put out warrants for Avery Brock and Tony West. Meanwhile, around the time the pair of criminals reached Texas, they had a falling out. Sources don't really state if this falling out was a result of a difference of opinion on their plan from here on out, or just the natural result of two unstable people being placed in one car together for days. But either way, Brock abandoned Tony and began hitchhiking back to Georgia. He eventually reached the metro Atlanta area, and when he did, he called his mother, who told him about the warrant and how they were wanted for murder. Brock just seemed to be tired of running at this point, as he walked into the nearest gas station and told the attendant what he'd done. Minutes later, police stormed the gas station and took Brock into custody. Tony, similarly, changed course and began driving back toward Georgia. When he reached Chattanooga, he ran out of gas and out of money. He walked, downtrodden through the rain, to a nearby rest stop, where he found a police officer and gave his confession. During his confession, he is documented as saying, quote, All I can say is they were devils and I killed them. That's how I feel about it. End quote. February of the following year, Avery Brock and Tony West faced trial for the murders of the three men. Initially, Tony West claimed that the murders were retribution for Brock, who'd felt embarrassed after allowing Charles to perform oral sex on him in the pink room. However, his story changed, and he later claimed the murders were a result of Charles Scudder spiking their wine with LSD leading to hallucinations during which the two accidentally committed murder. Forensic analysis, however, revealed that testing on the wine glasses and the bottles revealed no LSD. The defense also attempted to claim that Scudder had bewitched the men and that they saw his golden harp pulsating with an evil glow. 
After sentencing and subsequent appeals, both were sentenced to life in prison for the murders of Dr. Charles Scudder, Joseph Odom, and Kirby Phelps. To this day, both have thankfully been denied parole several times. Months following the murders, arsonists burned the manor house as well as the chicken house, and macabre tourists stole the pink gargoyle and other effects from the land. The ruins of the home still stand, the land overgrown miles from the nearest road. In the years since the murder, the nearest neighbor to Corpsewood Manor, Raymond Williams, told reporters that he had discussed religion with Charles Scudder. Charles explained to him that he was an atheist and had only joined the Church of Satan formally to explore it and see what it was about, but was not an active participant. Friends of the couple also said that in the era when homosexuality was so taboo, it would have likely made the church very appealing to the couple as they stress that anything that makes two consenting adults happy is something to be encouraged. Despite the logging road to the home no longer being open or in use, some curious tourists still make the trek out to the Corpsewood Manor ruins. The area of the home, Taylor's Ridge, now has a new name amongst locals, Devil Worshippers Mountain. Visitors to the area report that almost immediately following the murders, people began having strange experiences at the area of the homestead. Sometimes phantom gunshots are heard, disembodied dog barks, or the sound of beautiful harp music playing. Sometimes shadows dart about the property, and once a visitor spotted what seemed to be the eyes of an English mastiff glowing at them from the tree line. There is also a rumor that anyone who takes a brick from the property will be cursed for life. Supposedly, people who have taken some artifacts from the area do say that they've had significantly bad luck since taking the object. Despite the macabre undertones, ultimately, the murders at Corpsewood Manor were an unfortunate byproduct of homophobia and townsfolk being afraid of those who dare to defy societal standards. Now let's talk about it. I haven't made any announcements or anything about this yet, but I have decided not to do any more true crime episodes unless there is a paranormal element to them. There are a few reasons for this, the biggest being that there are so many excellent true crime podcasts out there that do this so well. And I sit happily here filling my small little niche of the podcast world, so I'm content to focus more exclusively on the paranormal and just do that as well as I can. However, with the occult and paranormal elements that are definitely here in this story, this one was a go and honestly kind of overdue. This story is a little tricky to give justice to, because while I want to tell the story as closely as it is to the sources, and I did, I also feel like most of us could agree it would be our worst nightmare to think that we die, and a tragic death at that, And all of our dirty laundry is aired out so publicly. Nobody wants our private or sex lives on display for this world after our death. Unfortunately, though, the story does just rely heavily on these elements. So to tell it well and do it justice means doing just that. And I truly hate it for them. Like with most stories, there are some conflicting reports from different sources. While most sources state that the couple's neighbors say Charles was an atheist but just curious about the Church of Satan, the church's website tells the story of the couple as being proudly and overtly Satanist, and this being the cause for their murder. On one hand, they have a vested interest in that storyline and that martyr-type outcome, but on the other, the couple drove a jeep with an inverted pentagram on it. And truly, it doesn't matter. Because no matter their beliefs, there are no reports of the couple having been anything less than friendly, hospitable, sweet people. So I file that under belief, whatever you want, just don't hurt anyone. So it only matters in the sense that it was a driving factor behind them ultimately falling victim. That being said, however, we do have to talk about how Avery Brock met them when he was 17, and he is said to have been a guest of the pink room. Now, it is possible that during the months he knew the couple, he turned 18 somewhere in there, 
which would have made anything that happened there legal, but I and many other people would argue still unethical. Now, that's of course ignoring any state age of consent laws, but it could have been legal, but it does feel a lot like grooming, however it played out. The same could be said for inviting Brock and Tony West to the pink room with the two teenagers. Although no sources stated that anything happened or was encouraged that night, so it's of course possible that they were just hanging out chatting there with no expectations of that. For the sake of avoiding a lot of repetition in the storyline, I didn't mention all of the many instances of homophobia within the town, the investigation, and the trial. For instance, when Tony said they spiked the wine with LSD, the prosecution asked why would they have done that? And the response was simply, because they're homosexual. The trial was said to have been riddled with these moments of equating their sexual orientation directly to any perceived wrongdoings by the couple. The painting Charles did is so creepy and fascinating. It makes you wonder if it was just a piece of dark artwork or if he somehow predicted this would happen. He seemed awfully relaxed about the presence of the gun if that were the case, but his last words of, I asked for this, suggest maybe it wasn't so unexpected. It could also be asked, did he ask for this by befriending Brock or by moving to a less progressive area? Or is there another reason? Also, it bugs me that the last words of I asked for this are documented in so many places, but nowhere states the origin of those words because it only could have come from the murderers, right? That had to be word of mouth from the murderers, but if so, you would think there would be reference to the police report or some other source for that. So you may not want to put total stock in those last words, since we don't have a solid source for that, only a storytelling source, if that makes sense. Sadly, and a little unsurprisingly, there are even said to be those who supported the murders at the time and believed that Brock and West shouldn't have been prosecuted by doing their job cleaning up the town, so to speak. Thankfully, the jury didn't seem to feel the same way. Reports of the subsequent hauntings have been few and far between, although that's not to say that they aren't happening. The way the events unfolded in such a gruesome way could have definitely left some restless spirits at the site. Not as a result of some kind of curse, in my opinion, but just like any hauntings, as a result of immense pain and turmoil in those final moments. As always, I want to know what you think. Have you been adventurous enough to visit the ruins of Corpsewood Manor? Do you feel that the potential occult practices or symbolism at the home led to a curse or darker entities there in present day? I'd love to know your thoughts. You can reach me on social media at Obscure Appalachia. I'm in the end stages of gathering listener submissions for your own paranormal stories for an upcoming episode. So if you want yours to be included or just want to send me an email, you can do that to ObscureAppalachia at gmail.com. If you love the podcast and would like to help support it, visit Patreon.com slash ObscureAppalachia. If you haven't already left a review in your podcast provider, please do so. Doing that and sharing the podcast with friends is one of the best ways for me to reach even more people. As always, thank you for listening. Until next time. <laughs>